Yeah, already getting texts waiting for meeting. All righty, welcome to everybody that's attending the Washington AGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series today. Hey, sorry, we're uh, getting started just a couple of minutes late here on our last webinar of the day. Uh, we had some technical issues earlier, and that's kind of affected everything downstream, much the same way as your first patient being late in your dental office. Uh, with the Washington AGD Stay at Home, Stay Healthy CE webinar series, we'd like to thank our sponsors uh, and co-sponsors, the University of Washington of Dentistry, uh, CE department, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics, Comet USA, the Academy of General Dentistry, uh, UW student chapter, Seattle King County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, and Patterson Dental for supporting us. Uh, we wanna give a shout out to the AGD constituents from Arkansas, Texas, and California that have jumped on board with us here. Appreciate it. Um, as you are coming in and signing in and getting familiar with the Zoom interface here, you'll see some flyers popping up of upcoming webinars and a couple of webinars that we had today so you can see uh, what is available after the fact. Today's uh, presentation is going to be recorded. It will go up on uh, YouTube here in a couple of hours, so you'll have access to those the video of this. Uh, for those of you interested in CE credit, we are providing CE credit for everybody that registered. That CE credit will be sent to the address, email address you registered with. That will come within a day or two. And please save a copy of that for your records, just in case uh, there's problems down the road. Um, for those of you that are AGD members, your CE credit will be reported to the Academy of General Dentistry uh, by the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. And you can expect to see those CE credits on your transcript within a, a few weeks. Uh, so, you know, things are quite busy with all these webinars. Some of our webinars were hosting over 1,200 people on uh, a webinar so it takes time to do this stuff um, when you see a QR code flash across your screen and if that's something uh, of course you're interested in attending please use that Q QR code also uh, if that QR code isn't working for you you can go to the Washington agd.org and that will have a listing of all our upcoming webinars. You can sign up there. Uh, yes, you might see a few flyers that we don't have on our website yet. We will have those up in a day or so. So we appreciate everybody that is helping with this stay at home, stay healthy CE series. We'd like to thank all our speakers that are coming up and that we've already hosted because uh, they're donating their time. This is free CE, one of the benefits of being an AGD member. Um, for those of you that are young dentists or just going to be graduating, keep in mind that to become an AGD member is uh, your first year out of dental school is only about $78 to be a member. Uh, good value for the cost of that membership. So we're about five minutes past uh, when we were uh, letting everybody in. So what we'll do is I'd like to introduce Dr. Kim and then I will stop sharing my screen and she'll do her presentation. We'll be taking questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat window. If you put the question in the chat window, I probably won't see it. Uh, we will uh, be moderating these questions. Dr. Kim, do you want questions throughout the presentation or at the very end? Well, we'll wait when she gets on. We'll we'll see what she says. So um, let's uh, go ahead and hold any technical questions during the demonstration. Otherwise, uh, any case uh, questions um, are welcome. Okay, thank you very much, 
Dr. Kim, uh, we've spent a lot of time together over the last couple of years. Thank you for supporting the University of Washington's student AGD chapter with all the hands-on courses you've done for us. Uh, I know that you're going to do one for us again in the fall, and we appreciate that. So let me introduce my friend, Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim is passionate about lifelong learning and believes the key to mastering her craft is all in the details. A University of Washington School of Dentistry graduate, Dr. Kim's practice has an emphasis on aesthetic smile rejuvenation via injection overmolded direct composite dentistry. An innovator at heart, Dr. Kim created the Smile Design Gauge, a multifunction clinical tool for predictable chairside smile design. Dr. Kim's systematic approach to additive direct composite dentistry forges her as one of the world's leading experts in injection overmolded composite dentistry. She has published multiple articles on injection overmolding, chairside smile design, black triangles, posterior quadrant strategies for direct composites, and restorative orthodontics, and is featured in the May 2019 issue of Dentistry Today for her groundbreaking cover article, The Dawn of Injection Molded Composite Dentistry. As director of her, director of her newly launched Institute of Injection Overmolding in Seattle, Washington, Dr. Kim delivers an advanced, intuitive, and intimate hands-on learning experience to clinicians throughout the United States and Canada. Affectionately known as the Disking Queen, Dr. Kim is also highly active on social media to passionately show her, share her knowledge and skills beyond the classroom and the, with the world at large. Dr. Kim, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sh sharing my screen and welcome. Oh, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to uh, present uh, during this time. Um, hopefully everyone's staying healthy and uh, staying active. Um, you know, we're trying to make the best of this unusual time and, um, you know, work on some projects that, you know, you always have in queue, but you never quite have the time or the energy or the resources to do. So actually, for me personally, I'm having a lot of fun with uh, this break, and I hope that everyone is uh, seeing the positive aspect of it as well. Um, so with uh, today's presentation, I actually wa didn't want to do too much lecture. I wanted to do about uh, half lecture and half demonstration because as you said in my introduction, you know, I do believe that especially if you're going to do aesthetic treatment, the devil's in the details and especially with injection overmolding, it's a great method for handling composite in a way that allows the composite resin to live up to its full material properties. But you know, we have to pre-plan a little bit more for the final outcome so that we can um, allow the final shape, um, especially in the interproximal areas, be remain untouched um, while we add some nuance in other areas that we can reestablish the final polish. So um, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. So as I said earlier, any questions about uh, the cases are welcome. If you have any technical questions, um, that's probably best for the demonstration portion itself. So what I'm going to do today is to kind of do a matrix mainly for black triangle closure with injection overmolding. And by that, what I mean is I before I treat a case, I really do a lot of um, evaluation of the patient's tooth form and their um, final aesthetic goals, their overall aesthetic goals. And I try to really customize the final tooth of restorative shape to um, what the patient desires and something that will blend with the existing dentition. And in order to do that well with injection overmolding, because we're not going in and doing a lot of hand shaping um, of the restoration after the fact, you know, I try to do a lot of pre-planning with the matrix selection. So I wanted to spend some time talking about the different matrices and the different shapes that they provide. And just to give people an idea about some of the, um, the things that I would be considering when I'm choosing a matrix. Okay, so we're going to be just focusing on black triangles today and just a quick review of some of the etiologies of black triangles. So um, black triangles can occur when you get decreased interproximal bone and this can be because of periodontal um, issues, whether it's um, bone loss, trauma, surgery, you know, we know a lot of those um, possible etiologies. Um, you can have excessive embrasure space and 
or deficient papilla just from the natural tooth form and or possibly the root position. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the things that occur with orthodontics, especially adult orthodontics. Uh, there are patient factors. So I think some of the statistics say that by the time um, most of the patients, by the time they reach their third decade, that they're going to start to develop some sort of black triangle. Uh, so the patient's age is a factor, also their biotype, if they have a thick or a thin biotype, any habits. And let's see here. So I want to talk a little bit about orthodontics. So I kind of like to think of this as a modern day problem. So for the first time, I think um, the ADA showed that there was a pretty significant increase in the prevalence of adult orthodontics. I think they saw at least a 40% rise from like 1996. And so with um, just kind of the general acceptance of orthodontics, um, especially for adults and some disposable income and just people in general wanting to have maintain a more youthful appearance, um, this is becoming a more uh, problem, uh, a more common uh, service that uh, clinicians are offering to adults. So the thing about orthodontics in adults, though, is that over 40% can increase in or can lead to um, the formation of black triangles. Now, I bring this up because actually quite a large number of my patients that come to me for black triangle treatment, ironically, they started orthodontics to treat black triangles. And so uh, without having had some sort of discussion with the patient beforehand, that um, orthodontics during the adult years may actually in increase or create black triangles. You know, I think that that um, you know, can be a, a real problem as far as informed consent. So um, this is something that I think that um, a lot of us are referring patients, adults, or actually doing adult orthodontics um, themselves, ourselves. And so I think that this is really something that people should have a conversation with your patients about prior to um, the patient embarking on treatment, especially if uh, they are seeking orthodontic treatment for aesthetic concerns. Um, there's also um, some study about uh, lay people when they were interviewed that actually that they, most of them will rank black triangles as a worse aesthetic dilemma over crowding. So again, especially if the patient is embarking on orthodontic treatment for aesthetic reasons, and this is something that you need to discuss with your patients. Sorry, here, there's a little bit of a lag. All right, so let's just talk about some of the restorative options that we have available to us. So of course, you know, we have direct, indirect solutions. Now, the thing about indirect solutions, especially when you're talking about treating an undercut area, so here you can see some black triangles on this lower anterior sextant. Now, in order to get access to those um, cervical areas, you're going to have to remove all of the sound tooth structure that's in the way. So, this would be kind of a visual. So essentially, when you prepare these teeth, they're almost going to be prepared in, in, um, uh, to become a three-quarter crown preparation, which is you know, the loss of a significant portion volume of tooth um, in order to treat an aesthetic dilemma. And you know, we also know that over time that there will be some continued uh, gingival recession, which will then expose the marginal areas. And as we know, the sharp demarcation between a indirect uh, uh, restorative margin and the root, you know, can be um, an aesthetic dilemma in itself. So another option are direct solutions. And so this would be hand placed uh, composite restorations. And now of course, um, up to now, you know, there's a certain stigma with composite bonding. And so let's review some of those. So when we are hand manipulating and placing composite directly in the mouth, so one of the common um, concerns is the uh, production um, of overhangs or ledges because really trying to get the composite resin to adapt uh, intimately and seamlessly with the cervical area, especially when you're working subgingually, can be a problem. Uh, another issue, and so um, this is something that I know uh, before I started doing injection overmolding, I used to talk to my patients about different aesthetic options and, you know, would compare the difference between uh, direct composite restorations versus indirect ceramic restorations. And of course, they're both, you know, tooth colored restorations. But um, what I would explain to patients is that, well, 
uh, direct composite restorations, we can match the tooth color, but you know, over time you get, may get some staining or color, discoloration of the restoration. And when the teeth go dry, you know, that you can see a difference because of the matte texture versus uh, ceramic restorations where I would say it's a little bit more lifelike or enamel-like, or at least that's how I used to explain it to patients. And so, um, especially nowadays with the, um, you know, more modern uh, uh, composite resins, you know, we can get a much better finish, surface finish, and these um, composites have much better color retention or uh, stain resistance. And so a lot of the issues actually come with the way that we are hand handling or manipulating the composite resin because we actually um, kind of create a sort of a folding effect where we actually will create seams within the composite restor restorations that can lend to weakness or um, areas, gaps where color can penetrate. Um, another, um, you know, stigma of composite resin is that it's not as strong. So a lot of times, you know, when we see young patients with uh, chipping of the incisal edges, you know, we will, of course, you know, first effort, we'll always try to uh, repair those areas with direct composite resin. And oftentimes, you know, after multiple rounds of chipping and replacement, you know, it's a pretty common uh, scenario where clinicians will, you know, advise the patient, well, now that they've reached a certain age or they've reached a certain, you know, um, you know, economic stability, um, maybe now is a good time to upgrade to a um, ceramic restoration, which uh, ceramic restorations were kind of considered to be stronger or um, a, a, a better aesthetic option. And so I think that when with injection overmolding with the different methodology for handling and placing composite resin, I think that there's a potential for these um, restorations to really be a really good, uh, strong and long-term aesthetic option. And I always harp on about this because one of the things that I really like to, you know, consider whenever I make recommendations to the patient is um, their age. Because what I want to do is I want to make sure that anything I do with the patient that I that they're getting worse at the slowest possible rate. So I don't want to do anything where I'm accelerating unnecessary tooth loss or tooth wear um, um, over time for the patient. All right, so we're gonna talk about the injection overmolding difference in terms of how this is different from composite bonding. All right, so one of the things I like to talk about is that, you know, we, of course, we all know some of the masters out there that do these incredible, you know, hand layered um, composite uh, restorations and, and, you know, rebuilding, you know, anterior aesthetics and doing smile design. But, you know, for most people, if it's not something that they, um, first of all, it's hard to acquire that skill. And if, if it's not something that is a regular part of their practice, then it's really hard to maintain that level of skill. So with injection overmolding, uh, for most people, um, it's an easier skill acquisition. And because it's something that a lot of times people, once they learn it in the courses, you know, they go and they implement it right away. And so they actually will start to build the skill as well and maintain it. Um, with um, injection overmolding, the inventory for composite resin is much simpler because um, you're using just a single um, body or single shade. So um, most of the um, um, composites will come in a dentin body enamel translucent shade. And what I focus on is just using the body shade, which has um, a really nice blend of opacity and translucency. And so with, uh, with that, I'll carry about five different body shades of composite resin, which I can use for handle majority of the aesthetic treatments that I might encounter. So with injection over molding, because it is, um, you are bulk filling the outer layer, um, it, it does have monolithic strength or it does lend itself to monolithic strength because again, as I said, when you're hand placing composite incrementally, then that is where you tend to get some gaps and seams within the composite restoration, which can uh, lead to some weaknesses. Um, with the uh, newer composite resins, and especially if um, 
it is monolithic, um, you're able to achieve a really high polish that um, also lends to improved stain, biofilm, and abrasion resistance. So these restorations not only um, can last longer aesthetically, but they can also last longer functionally. Okay, so let's quickly go over the injection over molding protocol. So, you know, I think that rubber dam, dam isolation, especially uh, after uh, we go through um, some of the, um, or once we get over this quarantine, I think that um, people will become much more attuned to the benefits of rubber dam use, uh, which I think is great. You know, of course, um, I was trained at the University of Washington School of Dentistry. And so, um, you know, we we're really big on rubber dams. And, um, you know, I, I try to show a really simplified uh, way of placing rubber dams because I just think it should be part of your daily practice. So rubber dam isolation. And uh, once you uh, place the rubber dam, that is the one time that you're going to dry the teeth and apply two-tone disclosing solution. So you're, if you probably have two-tone disclosing solution sitting around your hygiene department. And then tooth preparation. So if you have, um, you know, if you are going to be doing uh, caries removal or if you have to prepare the teeth, then you will do that. Um, and then you'll um, do the air polish. You know, sometimes with the aesthetic treatments, I never actually um, prep the tooth or cut into the tooth. And so the only tooth preparation is actually just the air polishing or the biofilm removal. And then after that, then um, we will um, then place the matrices that, you know, I will have pre-selected, especially for black triangle closure. I'm gonna pause here just for a second because it looks like there is a question and so Donnelly is asking, how much of a premium do you charge for injection over molding? Are you limited on what you can charge due to insurance fees? So with um, my um, services, aesthetic treatment for patients, when they come to me for uh, this type of treatment, it is fee for service. So um, it is a bit of a sliding scale because the, um, the final fee will depend on the number of aesthetic issues that I have to overcome to achieve the patient's final aesthetic result. So sometimes it's an incisal edge repair, if it's a, you know, managing coloration, rotations, things like that. So, so all of that will kind of add to the final cost. Now that doesn't mean that I don't ever do these uh, restorations or provide this service. Um, for insurance, um, and I will do this, especially if it's really the only patient, the patient's only option. They can't afford um, my fee for service fees, and um, or if you know we're doing this uh, for um, treatment of disease. So a lot of times when I do, um, you know, um, just have you know, the class for a restoration for treatment of disease, I do also. Um, I guess I should say every. Time I do a composite restoration, I'm doing it with the injection over molding technique. How I feed for it depends on how the patient presents, if it's a disease treatment or if it's an aesthetic treatment. If it's a patient, if it's an aesthetic treatment with high demands, that's um, going to be a fee for service procedure or fee for service um, cost. If it's um, a patient in the practice and it's uh, treating disease, then that will be for insurance fees. But especially because I've been doing this for 10 years, I'm pretty quick at it. Um, I just like to plan a little bit extra time for um, management of patients if it's uh, high aesthetic demands. Um, so just a ballpark number. Um, so on average, um, a single tooth injection over molded aesthetic treatment might be $1,000. Um, it's, so I always tell uh, clinicians, that think of it this way because you know it varies from region to region. So if essentially you're becoming the ceramist um, for um, this treatment, then you can, once you get good, then you can essentially back out your lab cost from, the, from your porcelain fee. So another question, Danica Brennan, so what is two-tone disclosing solution and what does it do and do you recommend a specific brand? So two-tone disclosing solution, um, a lot of times your hygienist will use it um, as for patient education. And so one of the brands that I have is made by uh, Young. Um, so Young Dental is where you can get it. Um, you probably can get it with um, your, any, you know, your uh, local dental supply rep as well. But it's just basically a, um, um, 
a die for here you go i don't know if you can see this uh, it just basically um, helps to give a visual cue for revealing biofilm because biofilm um, especially uh, when before i do the injection over molding like i said oftentimes the only tooth preparation that i'm doing for these um, aesthetic treatments is air polishing with alumina trihydroxide or aluminum oxide uh, to uh, condition the tooth and to remove biofilm. So I want a visual cue uh, to make sure that I've um, completely scoured the tooth strip surface. Um, so uh, you can also, I think this is also probably called a plaque indicator. Anyway, so this uh, two-tone disclosing solution by, from Young, uh, the reference number is 233102. But like I said, it's a pretty common product. You'll probably get it from your dental supply rep. Okay, so let's move on. Now with injection overmolding, injection overmolding itself is a three-step process typically. Um, so the first thing is um, you're going to, you know, fully condition your tooth. So you're going to apply etch. And then the three steps is application of adhesive, which is then air thinned but not cured. Um, then you're going to place your flowable composite and that's not cured. And then you're going to um, place uh, your regular composite and then the entire three uh, uh, will be uh, cured as an entire complex. All right, so here's an example of this black triangle treatment. So typically I do warm my composite. Um, so here with the matrices, these are some of the BioClear uh, matrices, anterior matrices that I've placed around the tooth. And you can see the gap between the matrix and the tooth where the composite resin is going to wrap around. And here is the immediate post-operative treatment. So um, this was actually a full mouth black triangle case um, that was a, a Dentistry Today article. And there was no tooth structure removed. Uh, the only thing I did was apply the two-tone disclosing solution and then um, you know, do the injection over molding technique. And so the matrices are made by BioClear Matrix. And on the left, you can see the preoperative radiograph. And on the right, you can see the postoperative radiograph. And you can see how this is quite a bit different from the earlier x-ray that I showed you of the ledging and the overhangs that can happen with placing cold composite. So this um, wraps seamlessly around the cervical area. And so it really can lend to um, really nice, healthy tissue responses. So um, as far as why we don't cure the adhesive. So we don't cure the adhesive. Um, the only time I cure adhesive is if I have a freshly cut dentin that I am going to um, have to do immediate dentin sealing. Otherwise, adhesive is just acting as a surfactant. Okay, so let's talk about matrix selection. So for me, matrix selection is determined by the desired final tooth form that I want. And so here's a case where I'm doing a midline black triangle closure. And so you can see that the teeth, especially in the cervical area, they're pretty tapered. And so um, what I don't want to do is to um, create a tooth form that doesn't flow with the rest of her arch. And so I want to maintain a nice tapered tooth form. So these anterior um, um, uh, cases, no, we don't use a wedge. All right, so here are the particular matrices that I chose that really can um, produce that nice tapered tooth form. And you can see that on the, you know, when it's placed with the rubber dam, it looks like there's going to be a residual black triangle. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about matrix selection during the demonstration. And so this is after the injection over molding and the polish. And so this is immediately after rubber dam removal. So you can see that the papilla is still a little bit blanched. So um, after um, a few days, I usually tell the patient, you know, three days at most, a few weeks, this will, the tissue will nicely adapt um, to the lateral pressure that's been provided by the composite resin that's been injected subgingibly. And then you'll get a nice knife edge papilla. And ironically, actually, I was supposed to take a, a post-operative picture of this patient um, 
the day before uh, COVID uh, uh, closed down our offices. <laughs> so I missed out on that opportunity, but I did see her during a, a previous hygiene visit. And so that residual black triangle did go away. All right, so here's another case where the patient has um, pretty broom-shaped teeth. So I'm trying to work with a specialist here, a periodontist. So number nine is actually an implant crown. And so she's got some asymmetries in her papilla levels, and we're trying to um, close the black triangles that are there, level out the papilla levels, and also manage some of the aesthetic issues. So she's not happy with the shapes of her teeth, so what I want to create here is a more rectangular tooth form. So in this case, I'm going to select matrices that will give me a more rectangular tooth form, especially mm -hmm. down at the cervical region so that, you know, the final result, I can um, minimize the over taper of her teeth, um, provide the um, lateral pressure to the tissue. It's not perfect because number nine um, was a pretty difficult um, implant surgical case. And, but we were able to get nice improvement of the asymmetry at the gingival, at the papilla levels, and also close the black triangles. Okay, so some other important considerations with matrix selection. So one of the things I always tell people to do is to look at the shape of the black triangle. So on the left side, if you see a symmetrical black triangle, I know that I'm going to close that black triangle evenly between two teeth. On the right side, you have an asymmetrical black triangle. And on this case, what I'm going to do is to close the black triangle uh, by adding more volume to number 25 and less volume to the mesial of number 24. And the idea is that what you don't want to do is you don't want to trade aesthetic dilemmas. So what I don't want to do in the process of closing these open gingival embrasures, I don't want to create a can. So I want to make sure that I maintain the vertical contact. Okay, the other thing too, remember when we are closing black triangles or when I'm closing black triangles using the injection over molding procedure, essentially what I'm doing is I'm sliding a matrix that's going to go into the sulcus and during the injection process, we are going to be placing composite resin uh, slightly subgingively that will then apply lateral pressure to that papilla to get it to then adapt and fill the space. So it's really, really important for these treatments that you try the matrices in prior to any sort of rubber dam isolation because the rubber dam is going to compress the soft tissue. So this is what I mean here. I've um, placed the matrices. Um, I've chosen the matrices, customize them as needed. And you can see that when it's inserted, if you see that slight tissue blanching and a little residual black triangle, then that's good because what you're going to get is over time as the tissue adapts, you're going to get continued closure, um, residual closure of that black triangle. Um, if you don't do this, um, there is a possibility that you can overclose these uh, black triangles. And the thing is that the soft tissue still needs to occupy some space. And so what can happen is either you'll get a blunted, um, uh, papilla, which is maybe not as aesthetic, um, worse, you can get some chronic tissue inflammation. So I just wanted to show this case an ex example. So um, in this case, there's a uh, number nine is actually a, a zirconia crown. And so what happened here is that you can see that the papilla that they're blunted, um, that's because of the, um, the, uh, uh, tooth form on number nine. And part of her retreatment, what I did was I took off the crown on number nine and I uh, placed a, a provisional of a more ideal shape in order to allow that tissue to then, um, to give that papilla some space to creep and adapt down. And so this is, um, you know, her where she came back for just a tissue check and I'm going to uh, let that tissue adapt a little bit more. And, you know, before we uh, continue on with the uh, final restoration. So you need to make sure that you allow the tissue have space to, you know, proper um, space to be occupying. Um, so I just wanted to show, because remember I talked about, you know, easier skill acquisition. So um, this is a black triangle case that was done by Brandon Walker, who's a fourth year dental student at the University of Washington. 
And so this is a patient with a midline black triangle. And so, you know, we talked through the case and what he's doing here is he's showing um, the a photograph of his matrix adaptation. Of course, you can see the nice papilla blanching. The black triangle is not completely closed, which allows room for that papilla to adapt. And this is the immediate uh, post-op. And so you can see the residual black triangle. And then this is a patient um, coming up here a couple of months later or a month later. And you can see that the tissue is nicely adapted and filled in. So she's got a nice knife edge papilla form that um, in papilla levels that matches uh, the other papillae. All right, so let's uh, move on to the demonstration. And during, in the demonstration, I'll show you some of the different matrices and kind of give you a visual of what kind of tooth form you would uh, achieve with the different shapes. Okay, actually a couple of questions. So um, any thoughts on prep disinfection such as that proposed by Pepis in 2005 and JPD? Um, tooth prep, so as far as disinfection, um, no, I don't do disinfection. I don't know that that's necessarily required. Um, I'm basically mechanically removing the biofilm. Um, so I'm not doing a chemical disinfection. Um, and with that mechanical um, scouring, also getting a little bit of slight uh, tooth preparation, enamel preparation. So for uh, composite warming, what I'm using is, a cal is an ADENT he heater. Um, it's a calcite heater, and I'll show you during the, actually, I think I have it right here. I can pick it up and show you. So this is the ADENT heater. So it holds um, two guns, a couple of syringes, and multiple compules, about six compules in all. And that's what I'm using. And that one, you can set it at three different temperature settings. The ideal is 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so uh, Kelsey, you're saying my post-op x-rays look phenomenal. Any tips to avoid voids when doing composite resins? Um, so warming your composite is definitely um, helpful. Um, so I tell people it's a little bit like taking a light body, heavy body impression of your crown and bridge. Um, so most people will use a light body, which will adapt into the really tight constricted areas. And then the heavy body follows and the heavy body helps to sort of push and further adapt that light body into those areas. So using the dual viscosities and warrant um, definitely is ideal. Um, I don't always do that 100% of the time, but that's um, um, preferable. And um, so Catherine Chen, how do you inject flowable substantially without causing voids? So um, I'll talk about that during the demonstration. So does this teeth make the teeth appear longer? How effective is it compared to tissue graft? So in terms of whether or not it makes the teeth appear longer, so when you're doing black triangle closure, it's going to make the teeth appear wider. Um, there are different things that I will do to help the teeth appear longer, and that's um, doing what I call root overlay, where it's a, um, it's a, a separate step of creating some cervical contour, um, essentially changing the zenith of the tooth that can help to um, hold um, the gingival level. So I can manipulate the gingival level, kind of like what you would do with um, in the aesthetic zone with um, the contour of your implant restorations. By creating a little bit of an over contour, you can manipulate that tissue level. Um, I don't place retraction cords. Sometimes I'll place um, Teflon tape on the outside of the matrix if there's a little bit of a gaposis issue. So no, um, I don't worry about the residual black triangle, but I make sure I interview the patient well so I know what their aesthetic um, demands are. If they are adamant, they don't want to see any pepper speck of a black triangle, I may tend to go a little bit further with um, posing my black triangles. And then I just talk them through that in terms of what the pros and cons are. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and just start with the demonstration here. All right, so what I wanted to do was to, I know a lot of people um, are curious about um, different matrix options. Now, um, Bioclare Matrix makes the, um, um, probably the first um, sectional matrix, Mylar sectional matrix, which is um, really anatomic. Um, and um, they also have a prescriptive black triangle kit. Um, the prescriptive black triangle kit isn't my favorite. Um, I prefer to use the regular um, anterior matrices. 
So one of the things that I notice is that a lot of times when people are doing these black triangle closures, they tend to overclose the black triangles. Um, so let me just kind of show you the black triangle kit first. So BioClear makes a black triangle kit. So we're just going to be concerned with this midline black triangle. And the way that the kit is meant, it was designed, it was designed to be a prescriptive kit where um, it's color coded. So you insert a gauge um, here, on, which I don't have the gauge with me, but the gauge is kind of like a probe that you insert sideways. And then it will indicate a color zone that you then pick a matrix that falls into that color zone. Now it's um, supposed to be really for orthodontically aligned cases. It doesn't work well for if you have any rotations. Um, it also tends to make the teeth, you have no control over the shape of the teeth. And so you tend to get pretty um, square rectangular tooth forms. So with, according to the black triangle kit, what that gauge would tell me would be that this uh, black triangle is appropriate for a yellow matrix. And I'll go ahead and insert a couple here. And so you can see that these are um, bilar matrices and they're pretty thick. So with these, you're going to go ahead and insert them and you'll see a little slice of gingerly. Okay. Now with these matrices in place, you can see that the black triangle is going to be completely eliminated to, and you'll end up with a rectangular tooth form. So the thing with uh, this and what the gauge is recommending, I think that that's going to lead to an unesthetic tooth form, but also constriction of that papilla. So what I found was that with the black triangle kit is that the gauge, I think, over tends to overclose or recommend overclosure of those black triangles. So I usually tell people to go down one size from what the gauge tells you. So if the gauge is telling me to use a yellow matrix, I would probably say err on the less closed side. So this is one size down. This is the pink matrix. And you can see that this Dr. is going to Jim, close those uh, black triangles a little bit less. But you know, one of the things about the, about the black triangle matrices that I don't really like is I don't like the really flat contacts. Um, that's the flat contact is what leads to the issues with um, correcting any minor rotations. Um, but see, it's a pretty square rectangular tooth form. But you know, some people really love this kit because of um, the ease of just inserting a gauge, picking a matrix, and kind of going with that. Dr. Kim. Now with me, I like Hello, to have Dr. a lot Kim. of nuance, a lot of control over the final shapes of my restorations. And I do spend a lot of time talking with my patient about what they want. And so I try to really customize the final tooth form to the, what the patient has already and to what their um, desire is. So I'm gonna show you a couple of other matrices. So there are a lot of other anterior matrices. I'm only going to show you three. So the first one is going to be A101, and this one is kind of um, intended to be for the nasal and central incisors. And with this one, Okay, thanks. Again, you're going to get a pretty square tooth form. and kind of a, a flat contact. And so, you know, I don't like the really necessarily straight flat vertical contact with this. And I'll show you a couple other matrices. So the other matrix here is the A103. And this one was actually- Dr. Kim, can you- incisors. But this one, I think, works a little bit better. Now, the reason I kind of wanted to do this matrix medley is that I think a lot of times when people um, purchase a kit, you know, they go by what the manufacturer recommendation is. They don't, um, they're a little bit scared to play with the different matrices. Um, using them in areas not necessarily um, recommended on the box. 
And um, I always go off label because you have to learn the shape that the matrices will provide. And based on the um, clinical presentation, you know, choose the right one that doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily recommended by the manufacturer. So you can see that this is still going to give you um, a more square tooth form, um, not as square as the other one. And um, this one has a little bit slightly more curvature at the gingival, so you'll get a better contact. Now you can also use, there's other uh, more curved matrices, but then you have to learn about how to customize the matrices and trim them to adapt that curvature, and that's kind of a whole other course. So I'm gonna show you another matrix here which um, is actually um, a matrix that I'd like for um, these black triangle closures. And this one is the A102. It was kind of intended for the distal of a central incisor. Um, but this one has the curvature. It's in a slightly different place. And so this one is actually a nice black triangle closure because it gives you a more tapered tooth form. Uh, with, I think, a more um, anatomic contact. And so clinically, if I were to try this in, and, you know, so I'm going to kind of manipulate the tissue here. If I were to try this in, because the rubber dam, rubber dam gums don't work, don't move. If I were to try this in, I had that little residual black triangle and I had some tissue blanching here, then I would say this is perfect. But you can see how this one is going to give you a more tapered tooth form, which is going to match the distal. Okay, so um, any questions about the, the different matrices that I've played with so far? Dr. Kim, are you All able right. to hear me? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna actually talk about um, matrix alternatives. So BioClear makes the really nice um, um, anatomic uh, uh, myelar sectional matrices for the anteriors. Um, I'm going to kind of show you some of the uh, old uh, you know, methods. So, of course, everyone knows Frank Spear around here. Now, Frank Spear, uh, one of the things that he used to teach was this is actually a thin Toffelmeyer, but you can get a thick Toffelmeyer, um, which is going to maintain more form, and you can just curl the end and you can insert that. And that was how he used to manage some of these uh, black triangles before there was an uh, uh, anatomic minor matrix. The longevity. So the longevity of these, because um, um, bonding uh, predominantly to um, enamel and which has been cleaned and I'm getting a really good uh, wrap of the tooth, um, if anything, it's, it's, uh, the thing that's advantage to this is that it's reversible. And the patients love this because it is additive, there is no tooth structure removal, um, and it is reversible, but uh, even the reversibility is a, it's a challenge, you know, trying to remove all that composite. But it's just really well bonded, and I haven't had any issues with seafish on these because I am doing everything with rubber dam isolation. Okay. I want to show you another um, trick, and actually uh, one of my friends, um, so he's actually a local clinician in Seattle. His name is John Bow. Um, he has a really nice case that he posted where he did black triangle closure using metal sectional matrices vertically. So I think he used a palliative system. What I have here is I have the garrison ones. And you can see that that gives you a nice shape, nice curvature, a lot like that, um, the last mylar matrix that I just showed you. Now with this, you don't get the, um, the wrap around the tooth um, as much. And so you have to be a little bit more careful with the placement. But you know, I just want to show this because a lot of times I'll get people like young clinicians that work in group practices that say, you know, they can't afford to purchase the matrices or they can't, uh, their practice won't purchase the matrices. Or um, patients that are doctors that actually reach out to me from other countries that say it's not available in their country. And you know, that I can understand in terms of availability, um, you know, some of that is, you know, not anything that, you know, we can control. It's just a matter of time. Um, but as far as the economics now, the, just to give you some perspective, 
the black triangle kit, that's the cost of that is about $5 per matrix. That's a pretty high cost for a matrix. Um, the regular bioclear anterior matrices are about $2.50 per matrix. Okay, so the garrison matrices, I mean, you can get those. I mean, these are probably, what, about uh, 50 cents or something like that. I don't know what the exact refill cost is. So these are much uh, lower cost. Another um, option is, so um, there's a, a mylar sectional matrix for posteriors is, called, is made by Kerr and it's called Haas, um, you know, sectional matrices. Okay, and with this, so these are the, these are the, the um, these are the um, uh, matrices by Kerr. These are mylar um, sectional matrices for the posterior. And again, these you can place them vertically, kind of like the garrison or the paladin one. So I'll take this and slide that vertically and you can see how that will give you um, some closure. Now with these, you know, you're going to want to make sure that because I don't use a wedge, I do do rubber dam isolation. If you are doing this without rubber dam isolation, you probably are going to want to use a wedge so that you get, um, you know, nice adaptation Center. of the matrix to the cervical area of the tooth. How do you deal with heat? My so um, with these um, matrices, um, because they're not going to sever the attachment, I don't typically have any heme issues. And so, and then also placing a rubber dam is definitely going to help. You post material on both teeth at the same time. So what I do is I will matrix the black triangle. So I'll put the matrix on both um, mesial halves of the two teeth. So I'll place it on the on the two central incisors, and then I'll fill one at a time. So I'll fill one, cure that, remove that matrix, and then do the second one. Okay, so here I just want to show you um, this actually um, um, was a case that I did. So this was the black triangle that I filled, and this was part of my clipping show. This is what I did. I used these two um, matrices sideways to get this result on that black triangle closure. And of course, you know, a rubber gum isn't going to adapt, but, uh, you know, with uh, clinically, the soft tissue should adapt nicely. And I would know that by trying in the matrices before. So just a quick aside, whenever I'm going through doing my matrix uh, selection and customization, um, once I get the matrix, because they tend to jump around, I just uh, stick it on the back of a post-it. And I make notes. That way I can make sure that I keep my matrices in place. Okay, um, so let's talk a little bit about rubber dams. So we're going to be, a lot of people are going to become a lot more interested in rubber dam use. And so I think of um, rubber dams as just like another tool for me. Um, so what I use typically for rubber dams, um, I really like the, for latex rubber dams, I really like the nip tone. So I have all three gauges. So it comes in a light, medium, and a heavy gauge. Um, typically, I will choose the gauge um, for the rubber dam based on um, how the patient presents in their biotype. So if they have kind of really thin biotypes and periodontal issues, I'm going to go more towards the lighter gauge. Um, if they have a really heavy biotype and if I want to make sure I get nice um, retraction or cervical seal, then I'll tend to go with a heavier gauge. Um, if um, a really nice uh, synthetic option for latex allergies, um, the best one that I've come across is uh, Dermadam, which is by Ultradent. So anyway, yes, I would use the verb dam um, like a tool in itself, and I would choose a different, uh, different gauge uh, based on the clinical scenario. Here what I have is I have a dental form, which has been fully isolated here. I'm using the uh, Dermadam by Ultradent, which is a synthetic rubber dam. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go ahead and do a quick demonstration of injection over molding um, the mesial of number nine for the black triangle closure and doing a uh, 360 degree over molding of number eight 
um, but to treat the decrease on the distal and then also to um, finish closing that black triangle. So clinically what I would do, isolate. Then once everything is dry, then I will apply that two-tone disclosing solution one time. Okay, then I'll fully dry the teeth and then here I'm going to finish prepping the distal with this too. Now, because I'm treating caries, but I'm also doing um, an aesthetic treatment, I want to make sure I create a long double so that I get good blending. Because remember, this is a single color restoration, so we want to make sure we get optimal blending. So here what I'm going to do is to create a convex bubble, a radius bubble, which transitions from thick to thin. So thicker at the feedback. Um, if they have a previous restoration, do you remove that first? Yes. Um, I want to make sure I remove the old restoration. If the restoration is well bonded, there's no carries. Um, I don't necessarily remove every speck of it as long as I can fully bury it. Okay, so I'm just going to lengthen that double. And the length of the bevel is going to be approximately um, equal to the length of your defect. And um, most of the birds that I use, I um, like the comet bird. In this here, I'm using a coarse frame. Okay, and on the palatal, I'll do another bevel. Here, it's not so much of an aesthetic issue. I just want to create a functional bevel just to get a good hang on the feel. Okay, and then we'll just assume that you know, we've uh, you know, finished our carries and we'll want everything. Okay, we'll make sure I prep this. Um, Distal and size aligning a little bit to um, make sure we make clear that, that good transition. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is to use a diamond strip. So um, I'm going to use a diamond strip to clean the contact areas and also clean the distal gingival areas. So this is a comet diamond strip. So if you have a contact, because even if you're going to do the microabrasion or the air polishing, um, you're not going to be able to um, really effectively clean the contact area. So I'll use a diamond strip in those areas to um, Clean the contacts. Sometimes I'm doing it to manage the tension of contacts for ease of matrix insertion. Um, sometimes I'll do it just to manage some site rotations. Okay, and then here I want to make sure that I clean that distal gingival margin. So here I'm going to take that down and just wrap it around the root. Making sure it's nicely wrapped so you're not cutting the soft tissue or cutting your rubber dam. Okay, so that would be that. Okay, so once I've actually finished my tooth preparation, I've removed all the fairies, uh, you know, treated the tooth. At this point is when I would be doing the micro etching or the air polishing and remove any remaining uh, stained biofilm that's on the tooth. So the thing about injection over molding is that you always, you're not finishing, ever finishing your composite to the cable surface margin. You're always going to be doing additive and extending past that. So the difference is, is that you want to make sure that you scour and you clean the entire tooth so that your composite, wherever it ends up, it's well bonded to cleaned enamel. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and place some matrices now. Now I think just for the heck of it, I'm going to kind of mix and match some matrices. So 
I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to place an A102 on the mesial of number nine. And one thing I want to show you is that, do you see how the matrix um, across the bottom, it's pretty flat? So clinically, because there's a peak of interproximal bone, so you may need to, and actually I do this uh, pretty commonly, a lot of customization, you're going to clip a little corner, a little V cut to accommodate that interproximal bone. So then we'll go ahead and insert that, and then I'm going to use my Explorer to, as I'm putting a little bit of pressure on my matrix, pull that rubber down and soft tissue out to make sure I get that matrix nicely tucked into the sulcus. And I don't use a wedge because the rubber dam is, and soft tissue is going to act as a gasket seal there. Okay, so now just for the fun of it, let's go ahead and place uh, one of these metal sectional matrices. We'll place this one on the distal. And unless you're using like a stainless steel matrix, I mean, these matrices, um, the mylar and the, um, these aluminum ones, they'll buckle. So that's why you don't typically have issues with bleeding because you don't ever tear the attachments. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and place one on the mesial. So this is a matrix medley, so we're just having some fun here. So again, I'm just really lightly putting some apical pressure. I don't want to put so much that I crimp my matrix. And you can see I'm kind of using my um, Explorer tip to help pull the rubber dam out of the way to get that fully seated to where I want it. All right, and then I always check my matrix seating from the incisal to make sure I've got good coverage here. So I want people to think about injection overmolding as separate from the matrix selection. Injection overmolding is really just about how are you handling your composite. So um, what I'm recommending is that uh, you do a three-step process, applying adhesive, um, air thinning that you're not curing that then you're applying um, foilable composite and then following that with uh, regular composite and if everything is warmed then that's ideal now once you've got the matrices placed i would do a full um, etch total etch of my preparations of my teeth air uh, rinse that and then dry and then i would come in now with my adhesive um, you can use a single bottle system um, or you can use a two bottle system. If you're using a two bottle system, just you only need to use the etch if there's no dentin involvement. Now, I know we have this deep carries on the distal, but we're just going to pretend that uh, we've already done immediate dent sealing and that we've managed that area. Okay, so we're just pretending because I just want to get to the injection overmolding. So when we do the injection overmolding, I'm going to take um, adhesive on a uh, brush here and just uh, really get that uh, wet the entire tooth. Okay, and then we're going to air thin. And as you see when we air thin that the piece of the kind of slow. Okay, now I'm going to come in with my warm flowable. And we're gonna bump up here in medication so you can see. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to insert that tip as far towards the palatal and gingival as possible because the idea is I want to wet the entire tooth with flowable because that's going to adapt the best to the tooth. It's also going to adapt the best to any constricted areas. Okay, I want to make sure I'm going to fill this entire cavity and I'm going to go up through the contacts. You're going to now come in on the nasal and assert that again. So the trick with the flowable is that even though it has reduced viscosity, it can still only move so fast. So you do want to make sure you take your time with this step because this is going to be the most important step for uh, wetting of the tooth and adaptation. So I always do make sure I wet the entire tooth because just like when you take your crown and bridge impression, you're going to apply the light body over the entire prep. Now I'm going to check for the palatal. Now you can see where I've got the first increment of global that's come through. I want to see that so that I can inject into that and merge the two, the facial and the palatal half. Okay, so I've got the palette to pretty much um, filled as much as I want. Now I'm going to come in with the regular composite. Uh, when you're using a comp field, there's always an air gap, so make sure you clear that first. And I'm going to always inject perpendicular to whatever tooth surface I'm injecting to. Now, again, with your like your kind of bridge impression, you're going to extrude most of the flowable, but the flowable is important for that intimate adaptation of the regular composite to the tube. Okay, so that's uh, probably all I need to do there. And I'm going to come in with my flat instrument. And so the idea is not to um, manipulate or, you know, uh, plunge into the composite, but really all you're doing is to lightly massage the excess against the tooth to make sure that you do have really um, good adaptation to the entire tooth. The thing about regular composite is that it's only going to go wherever you place it or wherever you push it to. Um, and so when you're trying to manipulate regular composite into a cavity prep without global, um, you know, you can get some gaps. And so that's why the global is um, a nice um, intermediary. Okay, and then I'm going to, you can see I, I haven't actually buried my instrument into my composite at all. Just cleaning up some excess. Just gonna make sure I've got it. Nicely adapted to the incisal. Okay. How little all I needed to do is just to make sure it came around that uh, mesial line angle and that I've got the good seal of my distal cavity. Okay, now what I'm going to do is to come in with some dry brushes. So I like these uh, bender brushes to come in and wiggle and then just help to clean up any excess around the cervical areas. Sorry. With them shade, do you normally aim to use enamel shades or dental shades? So, any experience of on the chrome at least. Okay, so thank you for asking that. So um, remember, I was talking about um, a simple armamentarium. So pretty much the only um, opacity that I use is body shade. The common mistake that clinicians make is to use enamel shade, which is too translucent, so it'll make your restoration look too gray. Especially if you're trying to mask a dark area like a black triangle or a class four, the enamel shade 
uh, won't work. You do need the um, at least the body shade. The den shades um, can be a little bit too opaque. Um, I know that there's a lot of attraction to the Omnichroma. Um, the thing about the Omnichroma is that if you were, you, part of the reason I get the color blending is because of the translucency. So I think it's fine for like small fillings, but I think anything where you're doing something aesthetic or you're uh, trying to um, cover a defect, I, I worry that it's not going to be trans uh, opaque enough. Um, if you're only filling in a proximal, do you only use a foldable? Other times you do not cover the facial. Yes, so that large midline black triangle that I did, so I only did the mesial and um, that one, I, I actually, I think I used both, but sometimes if it's a really constricted uh, case, I would recommend just using global. So the last case that was showed um, that Brandon did, that was uh, with just global composite. And global is still, regular composite is about 75% filled, global is about 65% filled, so it's still a good strong composite. It's not like the old globals. So I don't have an issue with using just global on some areas, if, especially if it's really constricted. Now, the thing with injection over molding is sometimes you're going to go beyond the two millimeter depth of cure of your aesthetic composite. So, what you do want to do is you're going to do a full, I'm doing it for a short time, but you're going to do a full 20 second cure, you know, buckle, lingual, and incisal, or if you're replacing incisal edge. And then you're going to, after you do the shaping to the final tooth form, before you polish, you want to do another round of curing. So here I'm going to, I did the buckle and the label curing. I did do incisal since we're not adding to an incisal edge. I'm going to separate the matrices here. Now this one matrix that I had here, I placed that there just to make sure I didn't get um, any uh, expansion of the matrix into the neighboring space where I'm going to fill with that, uh, the nasal of number nine. So now I'm going to just peel the matrices away. And you can see that a big advantage of the mylar matrices is that you can cure through them. I'm going to go ahead and remove these matrices. So when you do do the and sealing, do you apply bonding in this area again when doing injection over molding? Yes. So immediate dent sealing, uh, basically what we're doing is um, we're um, sealing the dental tubules. Um, it's the first step of our, um, you know, establishing good dentin adhesion. Um, if we have a deep dental area, then I'm going to apply a flowable to that dent to protect the hybrid layer. And then after I've done that, so that would be what I call concentric layering, where I'm doing an internal layer of flowable over the dent. And then after that, then I will um, do the three steps of the injection over All right, so here I'm going to now go ahead and place that other matrix and do the other half of the black triangle. So you can see I had um, all the matrices on first. I um, did the injection over holding a one tooth. I took away the matrices. Now I'm going to do the second one. So again, you know, edge rinse and dry. This one, we don't have any, um, there's no uh, dentin involved. So we're just going to apply the adhesive all over. Here on the mylar, you can see how I'm wiggling that um, in. What do you order the brushes? Uh, the brushes, I um, let me see here. I think those are, um, is it Burkhart? Okay. So that's not cured and then I'm going to end with the full bowl. So here with this one, the mylar matrix, you can see the full bowl action a little bit more. So you can see I've inserted the tip all the way and I'm injecting that full bowl more slowly, giving that full bowl a chance to adapt. 
And I'm going to continue that flow bowl all the way up through the contact. What brand of flow do you use and do you ever get flow bowl seeping outside the matrix? So um, the I match the flow bowl to the composite because I'm shade matching. So um, right now what I'm using here is I'm using um, Evan S. You can get the flow bowl extruding past the matrix. Um, it really depends on the viscosity of the flow bowl. So um, Voltex Supreme Ultra has a nice flow bowl composite. Um, with that, it's a little bit of a runnier viscosity than the FNS, um, especially when it's heated. Um, the FNS has a little bit more body to it. So here, I'll just just do um, just flow bowl, just so you kind of see what the difference is. Now, everyone's temptation is always going to be to kind of pinch that matrix and squeeze it. Hey, don't do that, because that's when if you pinch it together and then you release it, that's how you introduce air. With this technique, you never have to worry about excess resin going beyond the matrix, basically. So you have an attachment, and part of um, the beauty of a rubber dam, especially if you're using a, a heavier gauge, is that you get that seal. So I'm not uh, concerned about um, resin going beyond the matrix into pushing into the sulcus so that it's creating um, um, any type of a ledge that's going to cause uh, tissue inflammation. Post-op instructions to make sure they last a long time. So post-op instructions really, um, the patient can just uh, continue to function as they normally would. Um, the only risk factor, and this is with any composite resin, is that certain foods, um, especially like um, uh, dark, dark fruit juices or turmeric, those are really can stain. They have a stain potential. Um, but just uh, normal brushing and flossing. Don't use anything weird like charcoal toothpaste. Okay, so now that I've uh, gotten these two conjunction I'm going to go ahead and do the shaping really quick. So the first thing I would do is just to access up at the incisal. I'm just going to use a, a coarse uh, flame bird just quickly remove that. Okay, on the facial, I can also you know, do a little bit of adjustment. So whatever composite you use, you do want to make sure that you have one where it's a, uh, they have a nice uh, matching uh, global and regular composite. Okay, so with um, a diamond burr, I'll just kind of quickly remove um, the excess to about, um, you know, just under half, uh, just about a millimeter, half a millimeter from the bottle. Okay, now I'm going to change to a football carbide. If there's not much horizontal overjet, do you make room for the composite by reducing the towel roll and upper incisors? Well, no, because this one I'm going to basically take it back to the MIP, so it's just going to go, you're going to have your fusion on enamel. So this is just an aesthetic black triangle changer. Uh, so we're not uh, doing, um, what happens is that you're going to do um, almost 360 degree injection over molding. And then any excess that's in the way of the final aesthetics or function is what you're going to remove. Now that's different from if you're replacing the sizal edge or if you're changing the fusion. If you're replacing the sizal edge, you want to make sure that you have um, two millimeters of composite thickness at that functional edge. We also want to make sure we have two millimeters of composite thickness over that.
Okay, so here aesthetically, I would just kind of take back the excess on the palatal, stimulating that the palatal process, creating that D shape until I start to see kind of a tiny spot. That tiny spot is an indication that that's down to enamel. So in this case, we're not uh, changing the fusion, we're just getting back down to the patient's natural and my teeth. Okay, so that's just what I would do quickly with the carbide. And then, so these are my favorite carbides. So Comet makes these, they're cheap finishers. They're kind of a, a cross cut carbide burr. So that means that they're pressure sensitive. So they're really efficient for cutting when you apply pressure. But if you apply light pressure, they actually leave a nice satin finish. And so it has a first step in my um, managing the surface texture for my final polish. If there's no existing contact, then how do you establish a contact with all the way after removing the matrices? So that's a different um, exercise. So here, what we're just demonstra demonstrating is flat triangles. Now I do have um, a demonstration for diaph muscle here using a peg lateral and that's on my uh, Disney Queen Academy account. So if you go to Instagram, if you have an Instagram account, um, request to follow Disney Queen Academy. And on there I have an exercise for a uh, diaph closure and creation of a contact. So that's the video. So on that account, we have um, demo videos that are anywhere between like five and 16, 16 uh, minutes long. All right, so this the two finisher flame where I would use to manage um, the cervical area on the mid facial and the mid palatal. Let me bump up so you can see. So you can see it's a cross cut finishing bird. And the thing that I like about this for especially at the cervical area is that even though it's really efficient for uh, shaping composite, it's also um, it's also pretty safe to the cervical tooth structure. So unlike using like a diamond burr, where sometimes you can scar the the root. All right, so that's what I would use. And now I'm going to go to the disc. So the disc, what I do is, after I just do the gross um, reduction, um, then I'm going to use a disc to do the final shaping. So um, what I do is I'll take, I pretty much use just the large coarse disc. So there's, I use either a soft flex or a commercial's choice. Um, so here I'm going to take that disc straight out of the box to the incisal edge, which is the flat edge. And I'm going to just really quickly mill that edge down clinically because I'm not replacing the size of edge. I just have to take it until I start to see that white spot, which is in the animal. And then I know I've gotten back down to my original length. All right, okay, on the metal form, it's just going to show up as a white spot. Okay, so they're pretty much right back down. Now at this point, this is nice and inverted. I invert it and then I'm going to bring in the incisal half. So the mandrel will naturally stop me there. Big mistake is when people come down to the gingival pull-up. So you just want to bring in just the incisal facial half. Okay, and now I'm just going to quickly Blend in the central half of the cycle. So I do this dry. Uh, the composite will um, insulate the tooth, and as long as you're not uh, really leaning on the cervical area, you'll be fine. So I can bring in both uh, teeth at the same time here. Now, the one way to look at it is actually really nice to look at from the incisal view. So that way you can kind of see how it's fitting in with the smile arc. I'm going to bring in some of that 
tuck in that distal facial corner. So once the gem does it get softer and it becomes softer and grit, but also flexibility increases, then I'll start to use it to bring in line angles. You can see at this point now I can safely bring it to the palatal embrasure and tuck in and open up that palatal embrasure to uh, so that uh, the patient's tongue is happy. And so the sequence for Disney is pretty much the same for any interior piece that I do. It's the sequence that allows you to use the one disc as a multifunctional tool. You get a lot of use out of that one disc to take the tooth, but then also to build the nuance. It also helps to manage the surface texture or that um, you know, really nice um, mirror finish that uh, has that nice uh, stain biofilm and abrasion resistance. Okay, so now that I've got that pretty much safe up, I can kind of play with flexing the disc here to build in a little bit of facial contour. How much facial contour I build with the disc really depends on what the aesthetic um, out, you know, uh, demands are. Are we trying to create a really um, ultimately natural tooth form? Are we trying to mask coloration? If we're masking coloration, we're not going to do as much of this because we want to make sure that we don't get any so through the color. Now, a lot of times what people will use uh, like these spurs and do markings on the tooth to know where they want to place the, the higher contours, and that's fine. Um, I just do it with the disc because I do this dry because I'm looking at the powder trail when I do this. I was avoiding those things that think from the teeth and bottles and then you want your mind to be getting stressed to put in a devil. So, um, because we Scour the tooth. There's no no minimum thickness requirement for uh, composite on enamel. So all I'm doing is I just want to make sure that I get that really nice and starness to the enamel. And so it's a little bit like finishing your tougher gold restoration, where um, at the final finishing stages you're burnishing your gold and your enamel at the same time. Now you can do this with composite on uncut enamel. The problem is when you try to take it to a table surface margin, that is when you start to open up the gap because the closet will always wear it fast. All right, so we want to make sure we stay on time here so you can see I've done a little bit of facial insulation, facial facial contour. Um, you know, depending on how much I want to do, I could do more. Um, let's just quickly move to the finishing steps. So you know, here what I would now do is be to take these soft flex finishing strips. So this is a question for a lot of people, you know, which is well, you're not using the wedge, so how do you manage you know, the subjectable area? So I take this and I tuck it into the sulcus, tension on one side and pull. You know, I just do that like uh, once on the medium side, the top of frames on the fine side. And that just helps if there's any sort of residual um, if anything I try to just help to you know, remove that easily. So I just wanted to show that really quick. Um, and then let's move on to the polishing step. So from here I can either go straight to polishing or especially on the anterior restoration, so I like to do a little bit more nuance. So sometimes what I'll do is to use a dense by enhanced cut, which kind of acts like an eraser to remove any residual um, surface texture. Um, but also can deepen some um, facial contour. Um, the one I've been playing with now is actually um, these uh, contour anatomy trimmers by uh, Clinician's Choice. Mm -hmm. So these are nice because um, these are more multi-use, but in cuts are really um, single-use cuts. 
So these actually, um, you can get quite a bit of life out of these. So you can see how when I lean on it, I can actually remove more deposit and um, get a little bit more, um, you know, nice uh, surface finish. And you can see there's a little center um, void that was um, below the surface deposit. Now, if you get something like that pop up, you know, that's really easy because I've been doing everything dry so far. Um, so all you do is put a little bit of adhesive right in that um, void and you just drag global into it and cure, and then you just move on. So it's a non-event. But I want to make sure I finish on time, so I'm not going to do that right now because I just want to show you the final finish. But here, you know, even though it's a really big cup, you can um, lean it and uh, take it onto the palette as well. Now, the deeper palette side, I would just take the brownie and just, um, you know, remove the excess to enamel. But here I'm just going to actually just go to the final polisher. So the final polisher, um, what I use is Comet's uh, One Step Polisher, Composite Polisher, and this is a really nice um, earthy polisher for getting that high shine. And we're supposed to use, it, use this with air and water. I'm just going to do it dry first. So this is paired with the key finisher. The key finishers give you the nice um, satiny finish. And then this, even though it's a large cup, I love this because you get a lot of surface area covered. And I use this on all the keys. So this one I will use on lower anteriors as well and posterior keys. You just have to know how to angle it. But the thing that's really nice about this cup is it's a really robust cup. And I can use this for an entire interior sex scent versus some of the other polishing cups that I've used that um, I can only do maybe two feet. And so this is actually a really competitive price point and it's um, much more um, robust. You get a lot of um, polisher for um, less money on these with this one. Okay, so that was just, you know, really quick, just mostly doing it dry, but when your assistant uses heavy air and water, what that allows you to do is to really lean on this and uh, eliminate any remaining surface texture that there is to get that, um, you know, wet glass finish. So we're just using a dropper here, trying to not flood my office. Okay. So you can see that finish. Okay. Are you your hygienist? Hygienist, so you don't want to use coarse pumice on this. You just want to use a non abrasive um, polisher, um, or if they really want to um, polish, they can just actually use one of these. And so, you know, over time, they may um, get a loose as high shine, and literally, you just touch it with the polishers for like three to five seconds per two, and it will just break back up. So before I do that final polisher, I would have done another round of curing just to make sure that um, I've got the composite fully cures, fully cured to the uh, um, full depth. All right, so I think I'm up, time's up. So sorry about the quick, uh, and I did get to show you the augmentation, but I just wanted to make sure I got through and finished that entire um, two teeth. Uh, I know that was really fast, and I hope that uh, people got some pearls out of this. And um, everyone stay safe. There's oh, any questions I can take for later. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey, Dr. Kim. Yeah. Dr. Kim, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Hey, uh, we've got some questions. Could you stay on for a little bit and we'll try and bang through a few of them? Sure. All righty. Uh, we've got a lot of questions on what were the polishing cups you used at the end there? It was tough hearing. So the polishing cups, so this one is the... So do you mean the final polisher that I use, the yellow one? Both, the both, uh, the okay. polishers. So the white one is um, Clinician's Choice. It's uh, called a, co a contour anatomy trimmer. And that one, I have it somewhere, box. Oh, here, that's this one. Okay. And it comes in multiple shapes. 
So this one I used to use the enhanced cup, the Densify enhanced cup, I still like it, but the, they're only single use. These are multi-use. Okay. The uh, final polisher, which is a diamond impregnated, um, diamond impregnated silicone cup, that's uh, this one, and that's made by Comet. And that's the one-step polisher. It comes in a cup and it comes in a point. Okay, thank you. And I would say that's like the best polisher. Okay, uh, I find using the BioClear injection pressure of the composite against the matrix isn't enough to get a tight contact. How do I ensure a tight contact without a wedge? Uh, are you using the thicker matrix or the thinner matrix? So it doesn't matter. Well, so if you're using the thinner matrix, the original 50 micron, then that one you should, you know, people don't have problems with getting the contact. If you're using the thicker matrix, which is 75 microns, um, so the problem, people don't have problems usually with the anteriors. The problem mostly comes with the posteriors. And with that one, so what I do is I, again, you can go to my um, Instagram account. I show people how to create a variable contact on those to ensure a tight contact. So you can actually thin out a, the contact area with the disc. Okay. Thank you. If you overclose a black triangle and cause papilla impingement, do you lessen the pressure with finishing strips? So uh, what I would try first is that, because the thing is that anytime you go into the interproximal area, you remove the finish. What I would try first would be to open up the palatal embrasure. Okay. Because it's a non, not the aesthetic area, you can polish it and that may be enough to relieve the pressure. Uh, you've probably already answered this, but how do you clean the gingival flash after curing? So that's what I use the um, the flame Q finisher for. So the where you get the excess, kind of like a little button, the composite, excess component, composite is on the mid facial and the mid lingual where the matrix doesn't meet. And so I like the Q finisher flame bird because it's more safe to the cervical area than like a, a lot of times people like to use a fine diamond, like a fine diamond flame burr. And that one can gouge the um, flame. One cues finish your flame is nice. Okay. Did you want to talk a little bit uh, about the uh, kit of burrs that you've put together? Oh, sure. Thank you. So what I do have is I have um, my custom burr block my Disney Clean Custom Bird Black. And so this was meant to be um, like an all-purpose general operative operative um, bird block. So it goes with um, just the first bird, which is for like deconstruction, either the initial um, access or removing old restorations. There's a coarse, um, super coarse um, diamond bird that I'll use for, you know, Pretty much any preparation, crown prep, but also just the initial preparation. Of course, flame for you saw that I was just doing a quick amputation of excess composite. This burr is um, a margin trimmer burr. It's nice because it helps people to create that radius bubble, that convex bubble. These two diamond, uh, these two round burrs are like a reduced chatter round burr. So a lot of you know, patients hate that vibration when you're removing carries. This is a um, fine diamond that I use for the interproximal line angle areas when I'm doing my preparation. Um, you saw this um, Q finisher flame burr, which goes here, and then the Q finisher, the football carbide, um, their mandrel for the discs, and then the two polishers. So this is basically start to finish the one burr block for general restorative procedures. And yeah. also, if you... If you're interested in the bird block, you have to message me. But if you're interested in any of the comment burrs, you can use the uh, code that's uh, disc queen, D I S C Q U E E N, that gives you a 30% so discount. Okay. I don't get anything from that. Thank you. And uh, well, thank you very oh. much for giving me one of those burr blocks. I'm loving it. All right. What was that? Uh, thank you for giving me one of those burr blocks. I'm loving those burrs. Okay. Do you often have to pre-wedge to fit the garrison band between the teeth? I always recommend pre-wedging um, if you're doing a posterior um, restorations just because there's a lot of benefits that you get with it. You know, protection of the tissue, your rubber dam, um, some PDL stretching, so it, um, and protection of iatrogenic damage of the neighboring tooth. So I do pre-wedge. 
Have you done black triangle closures on molars? Yes. So um, dentistry today, I think it was in 2017, is uh, my full mouth black triangle article where I basically did an entire mouth all the way to the distal of the first molars, upper and lower arch. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about bleeding from the gums when you remove one matrix before filling the other? If you're, um, so on the anterior teeth, that's not a problem. Where you get bleeding is when you have a wedge. So like posterior quadrants. So what you do is you remove the matrix, but you don't remove the wedge. Okay. Uh, lots of questions about rubber dam. So <laughs> that might be a good topic to cover with a webinar in the future. Uh, but do you use floss ligatures to invert the rubber dam on the teeth uh, you're working on to create a better seal in the area? Uh, yeah, so the rubber dam, I think, is really, everyone's going to be really interested in rubber dams. <laughs> so we yeah. are actually um, going to be, um, I have a YouTube video for rubber damology, but we're going to be producing like a five, six minute video on rubber dam punching and placement. Um, that's going to be on the Disney Clean Academy. And so the thing about rubber dam is that once you um, place it, the main thing is tucking the rubber dam so that you get that good seal. Um, a lot of times when I see people, their photos, the rubber dam is not properly tucked. So if you don't tuck it, then you don't get the seal. Um, but um, I think the other mistake that a lot of people make is that they try to push the septum down in between the teeth and they cut the rubber dam. And you, when I, I pull it down, so the rubber dam when I'm flossing, it's more like I'm pulling it down. So instead of um, pushing it down, you're always flossing between a tooth and the rubber dam. And I'll see if I can kind of release this a little bit so I can show you. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. But um, yeah, because it doesn't matter because I mean, I'll use a heavy gauge rubber dam and a lot of times people think, well, the, the trick is to punch them, the holes really close together or use a really thin rubber dam and all that does is it gives you the Sorry to say, Tim, it gives you the thong effect. <laughs> it doesn't really do much. Yes, yes, that's what it All does. Right, so yes. here it pops that one up. So when you floss the rubber dam down, so what people will do, they'll try to just push that down and they essentially cut the septum. So I always have the floss one side on the tooth and one side on the rubber dam, so you're pulling it down. It's a pulling instead of a pushing effect. But um, yeah, and then you tuck it. And so we do, I do really recommend that people use a rubber dam stamp because, um, you know, the other thing too is uh, making sure that you get the spacing of the holes good, but then also using the proper size hole punch for your, um, for each tooth. So people tend to punch them too big. And cleanly yeah. punch. So air along the way will help with the tucking as well. If your system flows air just to uh, get the um, saliva out of the way so that it, um, you're able to tuck it more effectively. Thank you. Um, and that rubber dam again is Nick Tone rubber dam and that's MDC that produces that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, how about a list of materials and equipment? Do you have yeah, something? We can, we can provide that. Okay, thank you. Is there a benefit to cure bond and then add more bond for a surfactant if the patient was experiencing root sensitivity? Uh, sure. I mean, if you have root sensitivity because you have dentin exposure, then yeah, I would seal the dentinal areas first. Okay. How do you prevent bleeding during air abrasion? And if it bleeds, how do you stop bleeding? Well, um, I do the air abrasion. I do that all with the rubber dam on. So I don't, uh, you know, usually ever touch the tissue. But um, as far as, you know, just use ferric sulfate. Hi, Jim. <laughs> I see Jim Rosenwald. Yeah, yeah. Do you s see any marginal leakage staining a few years after treatment? Uh, I, the only place where I've seen it would be... Um, Areas uh, like if I was doing a full injection over molding, but I wasn't managing the cervical area for aesthetic treatments. So it was more like I was doing it to phase treatment. 
Um, so I wasn't intentionally trying to really seal like the facial area. Okay. So, cause if usually if you're tucking it subgingively, it's fine. Right. How do you determine when composite can be added to just one tooth to close black triangle and when you need to add composite to both adjacent teeth? I'm sorry, what was that again? It was uh, when you have a black triangle, when you have to treat one tooth versus both teeth. How do you determine? How do I determine which one? Whether you have to treat one or two teeth. Oh, well, the, whether I treat one or two depends on the black triangle. So remember I said if it's a symmetrical black triangle, it's probably going to be both. If it's an asymmetrical black triangle, you can probably add more to one and close it. Okay, uh, you probably saw Dr. Rosenwald's uh, uh, question there. When you showed cases with pre-existing crown, one on an implant, one zirconia, were you replacing the crowns with overmolding? Um, I have... I've overmolded an implant abutment. I've also replaced uh, crowns with overmolding. I've also replaced uh, veneers with overmolding. Okay. Because. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you can. Uh, how do you avoid installing overhangs? Is there a lot of interproximal stripping? Um, so the trick to avoiding the overhangs is the matrix placement. So I know someone asked about how do you know when it's fully adapted subgingively. And the way I would say is this, which is when I teach it on, with a dental form, I do like a one millimeter stripe on the gingival area with the Sharpie. And I teach people that to, it's a feel. You have to learn that feel of when the matrix is bottomed out. And so having that visual cue um, will help you initially to, okay, when you see that that stripe should completely disappear. So you don't necessarily use that on the patient, you know, like for your treatment, because if once you apply adhesive, it'll remove the mark, but you can just do that initially, like on your assistant, grab your assistant and go ahead and do that and just play with it, yeah. <laughs> All right, nice to see that you abuse your assistants as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, let's see. What are your thoughts on using Garrison anterior pre-contoured mylar matrices? Um, the anterior, I don't, I'm not familiar with those. I've seen the um, posterior curved mylar matrices. I'm not familiar with the anterior one, so I can't comment. Okay. But you saw, I mean, in the matrix medley, I was showing you a Toffelmeyer and Garrison yep. metal sectional matrix. So yep, if it absolutely. works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, do you ever secure your matrices with resin on the lingual aspect of the tooth to be restored in large preps wherein the matrix may become mobile? Um, what I've done instead is as I've tacked it onto the neighboring tooth. So I'll punch a hole through the matrix with the rubber dam punch. I'll squirt flowable through it and tack it onto the neighboring tooth to position it. Can you compare your technique with the style Dr. Corky Willa, Willa uh, teaches as both closed black triangles? Um, you know, actually, I can't because I'm not, I'm not familiar with the details of how um, he does it. So otherwise, I would. So I can't respond because I don't know. Uh, how do you avoid noticing the distinction between composite and enamel on number nine, if you don't prep and put in a bevel. So, um, so the way that I would say it is this. So you have to, if you're color matching, then you can have, you can just inject, you can just do a half of tooth. Or when you, if you inject the full tooth, you can get away with having islands of enamel pop through. Because remember I said with injection over molding, you're going to wrap the tooth, but then you're going to remove everything that's in the way of function and aesthetics. If you're color matching, that's easy. If you're not color matching, then you have to do things like either maintain volume of composite or um, prepare the tooth or both in order to maintain thickness of the composite material. After polishing, do you follow up with an unfilled resin to pre prevent staining? No, the unfilled resin is used to fill the gap that forms at, as you polish your composite past the cable surface margin. Because remember I said the composite is softer and if you try to marginate it, a ditch will open up and that's where you get the stain. 
So with injection or molding, it's extension for prevention. <laughs> so, you know, not like the way GV Black talks about it, but it's extension past the cable surface margin to prevent biofilm accumulation and stain and leakage. The question was, why add regular composite on the facial during filling the cavity on number nine? Why add regular composite? Because I will do just flow, but only if it's a small constricted area, like a black triangle. I will do the full, um, you know, dual viscosities if I'm um, basically filling the entire facial uh, with composite because even though the flowables today are good as a restorative material, they have a little bit less shine retention than the regular composites. Okay. The uh, question is, you don't polish or finish the interproximal areas? No, because that's why I was doing the whole matrix medley. The whole thing about that is that you select the matrix that's going to give you the final tooth form that you want so that you're not going into the interproximal areas and disturbing that finish that you have. So then you don't have to polish those interproximal areas. Okay. Uh, just uh, there's a lot of thank yous uh, for the great presentation today from a lot of people. So I just wanted to add that in. Also, we're getting questions. Okay, this uh, was going to be a one credit course. No, uh, with the length of time that we're going here, you will be getting two hours of credit, everyone. Thank you for that question. Um, somebody asks, are you not using Magic Mix for polishing anymore? Yes, I don't use Magic Mix for polishing. I use the Enhance Cup or the Contours um, because the thing about the Magic Mix is um, the pumice gets embedded interproximally and subgingivally, and it takes a bit of work to make sure that you fully get all of that out um, before you do go with the final polishing step. Do you use flush ligations and do you use lubricating agent for your rubber dam? I don't use floss. I only use floss ligation. So if I'm not using a clamp and if I'm trying to um, extend the rubber dam, if I'm doing an anterior sextant, I always take it to like the distal of the second by cuspids. And then I ligate. I don't ligate with floss. I ligate with the corner of the rubber dam that I've cut because it holds better. So I cut a corner of the rubber dam, I floss that down. Um, and then what was the other question? <laughs> uh, it was, oh, sorry, uh, uh, ligation. Oh, lubrication. Oh, lubrication, no, I don't. yes. Yeah, I don't, but you can. You can use some leftover topical, whatever, but I don't. Yeah. Okay, uh, how would the composite bond to a porcelain long term? Um, so bonding to porcelain long term, I mean, you're going to have to go through, um, you know, with the micro etching and um, hydrofluoric acid and silane, all of that, you know, under isolation. You can manage that for a while if it's not in function, if you're not putting any occlusal forces on it. I guess my question would be this. If you're trying to um, bond, repair porcelain, I would think that for the most part, it, it, fractured because there was a functional issue. <laughs> so then I think you're kind of set up for your composite probably not lasting, your composite repair not lasting either. Okay. Is it necessary to place composite on all over the enamel like you did on number nine of your dental form? And I oh, so um, actually, what was it? It was number number eight. Well, the reason why I did it on that entire tooth was because I was treating a, the mesial black triangle as well as a distal deep caries. So in a case like that, it's actually easier just to inject and remove the whole tooth and shape it back and polish it. And then whatever enamel island that pops through, if you're matching color, that's okay. That's sustainable. That's actually easier than trying to place composite, just the right amount of composite exactly where you need it. Okay. Uh, does warming the composite multiple times reduce any of the properties of it? So um, with that, it, it, it depends on the composite. So certain composites like um, APX, you cannot warm it repeatedly and you can't warm it for prolonged periods of time. You can only warm it just before you use it. Um, certain other composites like the Evanes or the Filtex Supreme, 
or the Filtec composites, you can warm those repeatedly. So okay. it depends on the composite. Okay. How large of a gap uh, between teeth can you do a com composite restoration? Um, well, if it's a black triangle, you can do pretty much anything. If it's in function and if it's a large gap, like in a posterior area, uh, that would, I would answer that just like, what's the longevity if you have unsupported porcelain? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how about a diastema closure? So diastema closure on the anteriors, um, you know, I, I don't really have any issues with closing a large diastema. The question is, if it's a posterior diastema, what's that going to function like? <laughs> uh, here's, is there a need for local anesthetic? Uh, I do because I do everything with the rubber dam. <laughs> uh, um, question, where do you buy the co composite warmer? You, you said that was the CalSet one? Yeah, it's um, Aden makes it. Aden, Aden. I don't actually know how to pronounce it. I should. Um, <laughs> um, so um, you can get that directly from Aden. Um, you can also get it from the injection overmolding site which is the core site and it's actually a, um, a, it's probably, probably save about $75 through that. All righty, Dr. Kim, uh, thank you very much. We've almost done two, two hours here together. So uh, we really appreciate your time. You know, you're a busy uh, dentist and, and we appreciate you supporting the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, our Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, we look forward to you joining us uh, for some courses with our students uh, at the University of Washington EGD student chapter. Is there anything we missed that uh, from these questions you want to cover again before we uh, sign off? Um, I think just um, if you're interested in courses, you can go to injectionovermolding.com. If you're interested in more um, videos, demonstration videos, you can just request to follow Disking Clean Academy on Instagram because a lot of the, there's more detailed um, demonstration videos here. We were just trying to give you a quick overview of just matrix selection, really. Um, but if you have any questions, you can just message me or email me. Um, you'll find all that information on the Instagram or the website. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to your helper there, Mr. Walker. We appreciate it. And with that, uh, WAGD just wants to say uh, stay home, stay healthy. And tomorrow, join us for three more webinars. Yeah. Thanks, thank you so Dr. much. Jim. Okay, bye. Thank you, Jahan. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much. Thank you, Valerie. You're yes, welcome, Valerie, guys. the background person like Brandon. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Val. Val, Thanks, Brandon. Val, if you just give me two minutes, I'm going to throw up our PowerPoint there again. And so people can see the time in web webinars. Absolutely. And Dr. Hess, we've got people asking again where the videos are being housed. If you could just review that while you're going through that, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Sounds good. We'll do that. I'll get up and run in here. And we'll just get back and we'll share our screen. And here we go. Bye. Goodbye, Dr. Kim. Alrighty, for all of you that uh, are asking, uh, the videos for the webinar that you saw today with Dr. Kim will be on uh, the YouTube site, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. That should go up uh, probably by tomorrow morning, maybe a little earlier. It takes us a while, especially on a large, uh, long webinar like this, to convert it over for YouTube. Uh, you can go to the WashingtonAGD.org uh, website to find upcoming webinars and also to get the link to the YouTube channel. Thank you again to all our sponsors, including the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE Department. And we'd like to thank Comet USA for their support as well. Those of you um, that uh, are AGD members, we will submit your CE credits for you automatically. You will be getting two hours of CE for this program today. So 
Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for giving us a little overtime. We appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder, uh, if you have a young associate or a student, we have a Crown Preparation 101 course, August 15th. Uh, we uh, walk students through uh, from seating the patient to releasing the patient after the provisional is done. And a lot of the students think they're coming in to learn how to prep teeth. No, it's, it's more of a systems uh, approach like uh, Dr. Quechen uh, talks about. Hey, we've got two really good uh, veneer webinars coming up tomorrow. Uh, Dr. John Nosty, you'll love his presentation. Just saw him in uh, Chicago. And then in, on Monday, my good friend, Dr. Starshvik from uh, Croatia is going to do a similar uh, uh, webinar. So I think it's going to be kind of fun to see how these two dentists approach the same uh, problem and see what techniques they use. Don't forget Dr. Alan Yassin is continuing with his implant study club and next week Janice Hurley is going to be with us on April 21st. So that's a good uh, webinar for dentists to come back and learn how to lead when we get back into the office. Dr. Tezar Suleiman is going to update us on bleaching and Dr. Michael Fling on Wednesday is going to do a fun uh, webinar that's looking primarily at anterior aesthetics, contours of teeth. And I think that's going to be one you won't want to miss. Remember, uh, uh, Dr. Fling is a, a Panky uh, graduate alumni uh, uh, mentor and he does just a fantastic job for us. He's going to be presenting at our master track program uh, when we get started back up again. And so if you haven't checked out the CE that's available from the Washington Academy of Gen General Dentistry, uh, pardon me, uh, please check that out. And we still have some space in our master track program, which is a phenomenal uh, set of, uh, hands-on courses, lectures that will allow you to go from graduating dental school to getting your master's in the Academy of General Dentistry in five years if you stick to our timeline. Again, uh, I just want to say thank you to all our presenters. None of our presenters today or on any of these webinars are receiving any compensation. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate uh, Judy K. Massoff for uh, guiding some of her friends our way. And we just appreciate all of you for joining us. So thank you very much. If you have any questions and positive comments, send them to info at WashingtonAGD.org. And just want to say goodbye to our friends in Canada, Texas, uh, California, and Arkansas that have joined us. Thanks, Val. You can take us out.